Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, my name is Mikey Mhenna. I'm going to be moderating today's session. I'm very, very, very pleased to invite uh, Natasha Pesaran, um, who is a PhD candidate in modern Middle Eastern history at Columbia University. She studies the establishment and development of the oil industry in Iraq and the Levant after the First World War. She's particularly interested in the role of Western oil companies in the region, their changing relationships with governments and the socio-political and technical worlds created by the oil infrastructure. Her dissertation, The Third River, the Iraq Mediterranean Oil Pipelines and Politics in the Middle East, um, 1930 to 1968, examines the social and political history of the first oil pipelines that were built to transport Iraq's oil to the Mediterranean coast. Natasha, thanks so much for joining Africa Conversations. Hi, right. thank you so much for having me. So, um, Natasha, let's start with the most basic question, which is, how did you become interested in Iraq broadly, um, the Middle East broadly, and pipelines and oil <laughs> more specifically? <laughs> it's a great question of what I think I've been asking myself for the last seven years, um, um, in one way or another. It's, it's, I don't think it's, a, even though I get asked it a lot, I feel like it's, I always come up with a different answer and it's always kind of difficult to quite explain how, um, because there's always a lot of different factors, but, um, I would say I, I studied history um, at undergrad and I got really interested in sort of connections and movements across borders. So this whole idea of, of nation states um, and sort of where, they, where, that, where that came from um, always really interested me. And um, I really wanted to study the history of the Middle East, um, I think partly due to the fact that I'm half Iranian. So... I kind of always had an interest in the region, um, but didn't necessarily want to study Iran. Um, and I think generally sort of had, had a curiosity um, about learning about other places. Um, so I kind of fell into it really. Um, and pipelines really fascinated me because they cross borders and because they're moving yeah. this commodity that um, is so central to you know, the global economy, um, and there's just always so much, um, the, you know, politics and power around it that, um, yeah, the pipeline seemed, seemed like a good lens to sort of tell a story that wasn't a national story um, and try and understand um, the region and its history through the, through the movement of oil. Okay. Yeah, so I, I later want to talk a little bit about why um, the IPC specifically, but I think giving, mm -hmm. um, giving a little context about this story and this um, sort of how the IPC came about. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about the background, um, what the organization was that pre-existed the IPC and um, how that sort of came about and who this dapper gentleman is here on this the guy left. On the left. Okay, so, um, so the story of kind of the development of Iraq's oil tends to start around, uh, uh, sort of place it to um, the late 19th century when um, the Middle East was under the control of the Ottoman Empire, um, which is now modern day Turkey. Um, and, um, and it's sort of, um, the map on the right is kind of, they drew this red line um, that, that's kind of basically where the Ottoman Empire was, um, the regions that it was control of. And um, at the end of the, the late 19th century, early 20th century, there was um, a lot of competition um, from sort of Europe, European, but also um, non-European capitalists and investors to sort of develop parts of the region through um, gaining these concessionary agreements. So they would like get a concession from the Ottoman Sultan and um, that, that would allow them to have rights to build um, railways um, and other, mostly it was railways, but other big infrastructure and oil um, as people started to use oil. So late 19th century oil wasn't used for fuel yet. It was used as um, for lighting. Um, and the main sort of, there were two really big companies, um, Standard, Standard Oil in the US and um, Royal Dutch Shell um, that was operating sort of um, in Indonesia and the Far East that were developing oil and they were selling it as um, fuel lighting. Um, and in what is today Northern Iraq, there, there's, there were oil seepages that were 
known and people locally were developing and using oil for all kinds of different uses. Um, and so, so the IPC, its history goes back to that period where people are kind of in Istanbul, in the capital there, sort of vying with each other to try and get what they see as this very lucrative concession to go and to have the, the rights to go and develop the oil. And this guy so, on the- Just for context, yeah. before we keep on mm -hmm. going. So that's like the 1920s, these, these conversations are emerging or is this before? It's before, um, it's-, it's like, it, Oh, it's pre-World War One, obviously, yes, yeah, pre-World pre War One. So, yeah. so I'm talking like end of the 1900s, so 1890s, 1900s. Yeah. Um, uh, there's this whole um, sort of scene happening in Istanbul with different financiers coming and saying, I'm going to, you know, get investments. Um, and so this guy on the left, Kalus Skolbenkian, um, was an Armenian businessman, and he had some ties to um, oil in Baku um, through his father. And he wrote a paper about the possibility, you know, the likelihood of finding oil in northern Iraq. Um, and so, so he, he kind of claims this role as being the one who wrote this paper and got people interested in it. It's, the details are kind of murky about exactly who financed what, um, but there were German um, and British groups that were also, so like the, uh, around this time in 1901, um, a British um, financier um, discovers oil um, in Iran and creates the Anglo-Persian oil company, which is today BP. So they were also trying to get rights to the oil in Iraq. Mm -hmm. So the, what later becomes the IPC um, was in 1912, the Turkish Petroleum Company. Um, and it was formed with, with German, Dutch, and British shareholding. Um, and Kalus Gulbenkian claims that he you know, played a key role. And, and the, the sources do suggest that he did play a role, but he often um, later on kind of um, made his role even greater or sort of outsized it um, in order to, to hang on to his 5%. His so he's known as Mr. 5% because yeah. he ends up having a 5% shareholding in the eventual company. Um, yeah. That's in IPC, in the eventual IPC. Right, right. Yeah. In the okay, so... Um, Okay, so the, um, the, the TPC sort of folds along with uh, after, after World War I and sort of turns into, IP, into what is then known as IPC, mm -hmm. right? So this right. red line, yeah, so just can you give us a little more context about the, the red line agreement? This um, red line. Yeah, so when I, when I, when I first met you, um, we were talking about this idea of the red line, right? And I was, right. I was looking into tap line and trying to understand how tap line works, and I was asking you, how it was impacting tap line, give, give some context, because it's still quite complicated <laughs> for me to Yeah, this is, so, the, so I'm not sure how, the, the early history of, so we were saying TPC, so that's because in 1912, there was a company that was formed called the Turkish Petroleum Company. Um, and um, as I said, it had multiple shareholding. After the, the First World War, um, the German shareholding is, um, uh, sequestered. I don't. Um, I don't know what another word for it is, but like the British and the French basically yeah. take it and they say, "Well, you know, you lost the war, so you know we're going to take this from you as part of this war reparations, right?" Um, and um, at the same time, the British and the French, we've probably all heard of the Sykes Picot Agreement. I'm, yeah, it's still, still a little difficult to know what, how much to pitch, where to pitch this history at. But um, the Sykes Picot Agreement was. Um, signed between the British and the French after the end of the First World War, the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, because the Ottomans fought on the side of um, Germany and they lost. So Britain and France are dividing up the region and it's, um, you know, we've all heard about them drawing lines, you know, the, the British the and French just kind of drawing lines on a map. Um, and that's really, really an oversimplification actually of how a lot of these borders um, get drawn. Um, but as part of that whole... Um, sort of change in the region and the d division between um, British and French, the British give 25% uh, uh, of the Turkish Petroleum Company to the French and yeah. say that you can have that in return um, if we can get the, the areas that we want. And part of that deal was that Mosul, um, which is a province in northern Iraq where most of the oil 
was discovered um, would be part of Iraq, which was under British control. So there's all of this kind of diplomatic stuff going on. Um, and at the same time, the Americans are really upset because um, the American oil companies didn't also get a share. So you've got British and French and um, Dutch, and Anglo-Dutch shareholding through um, Royal Dutch Shell in, in the company. Um, and so in 1928, the Americans also get 25%. So they work out this deal um, with the other shareholders and there's diplomatic representation going on. Um, and they basically, the, the red line, if, if you go back to the previous slide, is um, a line that, the, that all of these shareholders drew around the region, which they, they said this line represented the former territories of the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. and that they wouldn't compete with each other. So because you've got Standard Oil, which is today Exxon, Exxon Mobil, um, you've got BP, um, Total, the French company, all... I, all, all operating together as shareholders in the, what then in 1928 becomes the Iraq Petroleum Company rather than the Turkish Petroleum Company. So there's this long history of sort of like backdoor deals and diplomatic dealings, all to kind of get control of this oil and then to limit competition. So they said anywhere else that they find oil within this red line, it's the IPC that has to um, develop it and they can't compete for each other. Uh, with each other for rights, if that makes sense. And this this part that is outside the red line here? Right. Um, where are you pointing? Just anything that's outside, like, so yeah. No, no, no. Part. The, at the border of Iraq, uh, okay, Saudi Arabia. That's oh, I'm, yeah, I'm not, not sure about the exact details of the line, um, why that's drawn there. Um, it's a great question. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. So once we get to this idea, okay, so that this red line is drawn, um, and at some <laughs> point we have to, uh, the the pipeline is built, right? And it's right. built from from Iraq to, and the 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 Mediterranean uh, ports are in Tripoli, <laughs> in Haifa, and in in Syria as well. Yeah. So the so the main. But yeah, Banias, so the line to Banias was built um, in 1952. Okay. Um, so the main two lines that were built, so they, they, they discover oil. I want to like put this in quotations because they say people, uh, Iraqis and um, people in the local area in Kirkuk were using um, and developing oil, as I say, for centuries before. Um, but in 1927, they hit um, a, a major oil um, Gusher, I guess is the technical term, or maybe not, if there's any engineers they can tell me. Um, but um, that really confirms that there's huge amounts of oil. Um, so interestingly, you know, it's, it's not quite as simple as the, then the, the pipeline gets built because they find oil, so they want to bring it to market. What I've found in my research that I think is actually really interesting is that throughout most of the 20th century, there's actually been too much oil um, in the world in general. Um, and these oil companies, as I, as I said, all of the ones that are operating in the IPC have major resources elsewhere. So BP, is, it's, its main place that it, it's interested in developing is Iran. Um, Standard Oil is in, operating in America and has um, also in Latin America and other places. So they're, they're all operating globally. And actually, um, they really don't want Iraq's oil, which is really cheap to produce to come flooding onto the market because it's going to lower oil prices everywhere and okay. it will slash their profits. So there's a, there's a real struggle to get this pipeline built and it, um, as, as a nobody really wants to build it, but um, the companies also recognize if they don't build it and, that, and Iraq doesn't start to receive income from its oil, it's, it's a country that's trying to establish itself um, and it needs revenues to do all the kinds of things that, you know, a, a sort of growing state needs. It wants to build roads, it wants to develop healthcare, education systems. All of these things require money and it's sitting on this really, really valuable resource. So, um, so yeah, this is a major struggle um, politically and also commercially on the IPC um, to kind of get it built. And then on top of those struggles, you've got um, the British and French empires that have div divided up this region. So Syria and Lebanon are under French rule and Jordan and, and Palestine uh, and Iraq are under British rule. And so the British want the line to go, just to have one line to go to Haifa, where they can yeah. control the entire route. 
and the French want it to go to Tripoli so they can control the entire route. And so after three years of insane negotiations and diplomatic wrangling and all kinds of backdoor sort of uh, dealings, um, they end up having this compromise, which is to build two lines, which is obviously more expensive and took yeah. longer, but that's why this, you see these routes. Um, and of course, after 1948, the, the line to Haifa um, is closed because of the Arab-Israeli conflict, the establishment of Israel. Um, politically, it's impossible for Iraq to tr export oil through Israel. Um, yeah. And so in 52, they build a line to, um, through, through, for, um, to Benias through Syria. That's the that British. The British, the British sort of push the another line up to through Syria. Uh, the French do because oh, wow. the okay. French, because the French, um, the French oil company, which is later Total, for most of the 20th century, their only source of oil for French national oil policies is Iraqi oil. So they're actually the only ones in the IPC who really want any oil to come out of Iraq. Yeah, um, and so that line to Banias is part of a, a, a reshuffle in 1950 uh, in 1948 um, commercially on the IPC, where the the French say, okay, you want these other concessions. Um, the other oil companies wanted other certain things. Said, we want to increase their ox oil production rate, and to do that, they needed to build another pipeline. Yeah. So, so yeah. sort of just moving away from the the history for a second. You've been yeah. working about working on this and reading on this for a few years, right? Yeah, <laughs> quite a long time. <laughs> quite a long time. Yeah. What has surprised you? What do you know now that is surprising that the sort of Natasha from a few years ago would have not expected to, to be true about your research? Like, has yeah. it unfolded as you imagined or has it unfolded in ways that sort of have surprised you? Um, that's a really great question. Uh, it's so hard. I'm so like deep in it, as you can probably tell, I hope I haven't like lost everyone's um, attention at this point, but you get so deep into the research um, that at this point it's hard to, like I'm in the middle of writing, that's where I'm at yeah. in the PhD as well, so I've done the bulk of research and I'm trying to just kind of put all these ideas together. Um, yeah. I guess, I guess one of the things that I, I've spent a lot of time in the in the oil company archives and so I think probably when I started I had this idea maybe of oil companies as kind of um and not and I'm not very favorable I'm not I'm not writing this history from as someone who has been involved in the oil industry or has any particular um sort of story that I want to tell about them I'd say I'm, I tend to be pretty skeptical of all kinds of of um of sort of power structures so obviously they're big companies and um and you know that they've they've wielded a lot of power and and i think particularly when it comes to the middle east if you say middle east and oil in the same se sentence you're kind of getting into sort of territories of um sort of you know it's either oh the oil companies were great they helped develop the region or it's like oh they you know they they're behind everything mm -hmm. um so i think I don't know if it's something that surprised me, but I feel like I have a better understanding of how they've operated. Um, and I think, as I said before, the thing that really surprised me the most is that they don't actually want to develop any of the oil, um, at least in Iraq. And I think, um, you know, Iraq really does seem to be um, basically a swing, a swing state in terms of the global oil um, production, where, you know, if there is a shortage, they might increase production. But for the most part, it doesn't seem like anyone really at any point wanted large amounts of oil to come out of Iraq. Um, and so that sort of seems a little bit counterintuitive because you yeah. think people are vying to get the oil. So it's yeah, like they want to control the oil, but to keep it in the ground. Um, it's like this barometer, right? They're using as a reserve to maintain the price that they're looking for. Exactly. Right. Uh, but they don't. Yeah. And just how much that is in tension, in tension with, um, the, the needs of, of national states and governments that need revenues. That in itself is not really new, um, that sort of tension between global oil companies and, and the producing states. But then something else my research has shown is by looking at the, at the pipelines, like how it's not just Iraq as a producing state, but also then Syria and Lebanon that yeah. in the, throughout the 20th century are also actually getting revenues from the pipeline, from the operation of the pipeline across there. So, um, 
I'm curious about some of the sort of like secondary or sort of uh, tangential research that's related to this. I remember mm -hmm. you and I once upon a time were talking about how there's this like interesting labor movement that's born out of Tapline. What sort of effects did the IPC have on labor in Iraq at the time? Or was it, was, this is a massive project, right? Um, if you speak yeah. to, if, you, if somebody speaks to the Iraqis of a certain age, um, is the IPC sort of imprinted in their brain? Is this part of the national identity? Is, is, did it change the labor, the labor uh, landscape? Um, did it change culturally? Because all of a sudden you're bringing in all these you know, foreign engineers. Right. Like what impact, what lasting impact did it have outside of economics? Yeah, so that, that's also a really, really great question. So um, yeah, I think that IPC um, definitely had these other impacts that you talk about, like cultural, social impact um, along the pipeline. I mean, so, for, so first of all, they're, they're obviously, um, you know, really present in sort of in the area around Kirkuk. They really dominate um, uh, the development of Kirkuk as, as a town. And there's a really great new book um, called... Um, I think Black Gold by a professor, um, Arbella Betchimon. I think she's at Washington State University. I don't remember, but, um, but she has this book where she, she looks at um, the history of Kirkuk and a part of what she talks about is um, the impact of the IPC um, and sort of this, the massive influx of laborers to the city, like looking for work. Um, it created a housing crisis and, and a water crisis in the town in the mm -hmm. 50s. Um, but yeah, I mean, she, you know, she would obviously be able to speak to that a lot better than, than I can. Um, in terms of the pipelines, as you can see actually in this map, um, there are these little dots labeled like T1, T2, T3. So those are the pumping stations. And um, at each of these stations, the company had like these basically these little towns, company towns yeah. with swimming pools, um, tennis courts, this kind of thing, um, obviously reserved for the European and American white managers and engineers. And then you have this major division sort of spatially and along racial lines um, in sort of the way that they manage their labor. So, um, so yeah, so they created, so, you know, in terms of social impacts, you're creating these whole cities in the middle of the desert. Um, and then of course at, in Tripoli and um, in Haifa until 1948, and then Tripoli afterwards becomes the, the um, headquarters for the for the IPC in Lebanon, and um, yeah, there's a lot of work I think to be done and sort of mapping out the effects of the IPC in Tripoli um, because the, there was also an oil, oil refinery that was built. Um, the IPC didn't build it; the French built it during the Second World War. But that refinery was a major source um, of employment in Tripoli, and I think yeah, it definitely had some impacts that I haven't quite sketched out yet. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. I mean, like, in, in some ways, like, so this, um, this logo, you know, it comes from this PDF, right? It comes from this PDF of online of the sort of like corporate handbook, <laughs> the right. corporate IPC handbook. And in many ways, it's kind of a boring corporation in so many ways, right? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, in other ways, it's like, yeah, in other ways, it's not at all. Um, in your research, are you, have you been speaking to, to folks who um, you know, were in, in, involved in, in those moments and they like remember fondly these days? So I, I, didn't, I didn't get to talk to as many people as I would have liked. Um, just part of what happened in the research year and, um, yeah. and it is difficult to, um, to find people who are still alive. Um, I did, especially if I'm looking at the earlier the earlier time period, right? I think sort of from the 60s onwards, maybe um, it would yeah. be e slightly easier. But um, but I did, yeah, I did speak to somebody actually in the UK who grew up um, as sort of an IPC, um, child of the IPC. I don't know, his father worked... Um, his father worked for the IPC in Tripoli, and I think he was a store manager. Um, and he, yeah, he had like really, we only spoke for an hour really briefly. He's now a major executive um, with the NHS. And so he, he was really busy, but he did talk to me briefly. Um, 
and yeah, I had lots of memories about sort of what it was like um, sort of living in Tripoli and being part of this world where the IPC was really, it was kind of seen as the height of society. I don't know if you had, like apparently the IPC had a private beach. Um, yeah. And so if you like, you know, you were really it if you got invited to go to the IPC beach and hang out there on this private. Um, so, so there's definitely lots of different sort of hierarchies, social hierarchies um, that the company is creating. But um, but they also had their own magazine too, which I find, which is something I've, I've read. Um, and it's quite interesting because it was a whole social, you know, it was a whole, it had its own sort of culture and and social um, history. Um, uh, I don't. Yes, yeah, so I don't. I don't know. It's. Um, I'm still still trying to figure a lot of that stuff so, out. But uh, I, I want to ask one more question before we start moving to the <laughs> sort of the quick fire stuff. But um, these these photos are from the Total archive, right? Right. Um, and then there's other photos, I'm sure, um, from other archives. And mm -hmm. the Red Line Agreement is a multilateral corporate slash right. governmental um, initiative. Um, mm -hmm. Is the story that the French tell about the IPC very different than the story the British tell about the IPC and very different than the story the Americans and the, the Iraqis right. tell about the IPC? Are there like um, different legacies that, there, that are, are being maintained? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would say no one's really like, there there's no one telling defined, everyone's trying right to. <laughs> there's, there's, there's not really there's not really defined there's not really defined stories of ipc because it gets lost in this yeah. like there are histories of total there are histories of bp there's history of american oil companies um and and so far as i think anyone really like obviously they're definitely within iraq that you know that that hit because it's it's the national history but that's the point yeah. right it's told then within the national history and no one then really writes about what about the IPC in Tripoli because it's, it's seen as the, well, that's Lebanon's story. So this is partly, I think why I find the IPC so fascinating because, and the pipeline as well, because it's not just the pipeline that's moving across, but the capital structure of the company is completely international. Um, and it draws in all these different interests. Um, so there's an enormous amount of material about it. Because yes, you go into the French archives, tons of files on IPC, American archives, tons of files. Um, and, but I do think it's interesting. I think for Total, um, as I said, they didn't have any other sources of oil until I guess it was the, I'm a bit murky on the dates, but I want to say like late 60s, early 70s when oil is discovered in Algeria. For Total, the IPC is very much, I mean, you can't really tell the history of Total without telling the history of the IPC. And they definitely had different perspectives. When you read the archives, the French are like, come on, let's get the oil out. Don't do anything, don't mess around. We don't want the Iraqis to nationalize this. This is a really important commercial holding for us. And the other companies are kind of like, meh, you know, you can just leave it in the ground. So, um, but yeah, in terms of narratives, because, because it's a company, um, yeah, it, it's not really popularly, I would say like in France or Britain and America at least, but again, there's that, there's that sort of, unevenness where yeah. for people in the region, for Iraqis, um, this is much more part of it. It gets, a, it gets a kind of why we tell histories, I think, um, yeah. and why actually the national history is still so important. Um, and it's something I found trying to write a history that's not national, it's kind of like, who, who cares about this? Who, who's, who's sort of like narratives are at stake here? Whose identities, like history is so much a part of, I think, identity building. It's, it's, it's yeah, interesting it's, to kind of get, a, get away from it. And it's also who's embarrassed by this, right? Right. Uh, and so who doesn't want this story to be told? Who is, uh, yeah. Right, right. You know, and why is it that, why is it in France and, and Britain it's okay to not know that there was a story that, that a lot of, you know, people from that country went somewhere else and developed a resource and, and what is at stake in all of that and why doesn't that get us hold? I think, yeah, you're right. It's very important. Okay. Let's do this quick Q&A because we have questions in the okay. chat. So, okay. Um, what are you reading or watching right now? Okay. Um, so, well, uh, I, I just finished watching um, Rami. I binge watched the whole thing um, during quarantine. So I'm kind of looking for something else now after that. I feel like 
I need another good show. Um, and they reading, I'm always for like the third season. It did. That's great. I I loved it. I don't know what um, if other people have seen. It. If you haven't watched it, you should, definitely should. Um, and reading, um, I always have like four or five different books that I'm like partly through, and they're all academic books. Um, so, okay, um, yeah. Uh, who would you shadow for a day, past or present? Okay, um, I would really like to sh shadow Mark Zuckerberg right now, um, or perhaps from 2016, <laughs> if only just to find out exactly what he thinks he's doing. Um, but yeah, I see a lot of parallels actually between the oil, sort of the history of the oil companies and the tech companies today. I'm sure I'm not the first person to point that out, but um, yeah, just how these corporations amass quite so much power really fascinates me. Yeah, so, yeah I, I would follow him. <laughs> I watched, um, I watched this TED talk with Jeff Bezos from 14 mm -hmm. years ago, back when like the people were like literally pressing left, right on the PowerPoint themselves, right? Oh, wow. <laughs> <On> the <TED laughs> and he was, he was pitching um, the tech industry as mm -hmm. being more like the electricity and the oil basically, oh, interesting. versus the power grid. He yeah. was like, people are comparing it to the gold rush. It's not like the gold rush, it's right. like power. Um, yeah, like, like, I think that's a hundred percent. Yeah, it's really just, uh, yeah. The pipelines, the similarity between pipelines and like the the underground cables for internet. Yeah, and the kind of the same kind of geopolitics that's maybe happening, but in the ocean instead of under deserts or land. And so yeah, yeah I think there's definitely a lot of interesting parallels. There's a, a before we switch to the next one. There's a movie called The Hummingbird Effect, um, mm -hmm. or The Hummingbird Project. That's about building. Uh, building tunnels for high-speed trading and it's so oh i've got to watch that okay it's with we'll jesse eisenberg yeah he's really okay so good anyway okay um what do people most misunderstand about your work or your line of work um yeah this one's hard um i'm not sure i think people just like think i've read about pipelines i don't know if this has actually helped <laughs> explain what i do um but i think yeah the idea of um being a historian, going into archives, like what that, what that looks like, I think is quite um, difficult for people to grasp. It's like, oh, so you're just reading dusty documents or, um, yeah, I think it doesn't really fit within, it's kind of like, oh, how are you going to monetize this? Like, what is, um, what is the point <laughs> of it all? I don't know. I feel, people need to, yeah, like, what, you know, what are you going to do with it? Um, I don't actually have the answers to any of those things right now, but, um, yeah, something along those lines. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> whose work do you admire or are inspired by? So right now, because I'm right. in the process of writing, pretty much anyone who's written a book or a PhD or any long piece of writing, I'm just like, wow, how did you, how did you do that? Like, how did you actually finish this thing? So, um, yeah, pretty much anyone who's written a book. Um, but also, I, um, another thing that I was reading during lockdown is um, this novel um, by Abdurrahman Muni um, called Cities of Salt. Um, and it's, it's a really incredible, he, it's actually a series of five novels. I only read the first one. Um, but I think he just does this amazing job through fiction of sort of laying out um, the history of oil development in the region. But it's, it's basically, it tells the history of Saudi Arabian oil um, development, but through sort of, he has this fictional place. Um, and yeah, you really, he really evokes sort of a lot of the things that I feel like I can't do as a historian, um, particularly yeah. when it comes to like people's everyday experiences. So it's definitely, I, I was really inspired by it and to try and think about how I could in, sort of include some more aspects about ordinary people, labor, um, this kind of thing in my own writing, because it does tend to get focused on, yeah, geopolitics and revenue and commercial stuff. Um, yeah. Okay, great. We are going to switch to the questions. Yeah. Uh, we have Nicholas up first. Nicholas, you want to unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, thanks so much for the talk. I got disconnected about halfway through, so I apologize if this got answered, but I had Two questions. You can pick one. 
uh, I'm a designer and I was really curious about the design of this the logo or flag with the mm-hmm. blue background and the yellow triangle and the layering. What's the kind of, what's that supposed to symbolize and, and that sort of thing. Yeah, that one. Um, but, I, and I think you already talked about what impact this pipeline had on communities along the way. Um, but mm-hmm. you can pick which one you want to elaborate on more. Unfortunately, I know literally nothing about this logo, so, so I'll answer. it's a great question though, um, but I haven't come across anything about it um, really, but um, in terms of the communities um, along the pipeline, yeah, that's something I'm, I'm really interested in. Um, as I said, the pumping stations are really um, interesting um, in terms of the impact, impacts that they have. Um, so far, I've done most research kind of on when the pipelines are being built. Um, and sort of thinking through some like the ways that the company uses water resources, for example, um, and, and draws on local knowledge in order, in order to find them, um, to find wells and sort of um, get enough water for these pumping stations. And they, they use a lot of water because um, they, you know, as I said, they have like swimming pools and they had gardens. So like you have these, um, the wives of these like English engineers growing roses in the middle of um, the desert, for example. Um, yeah, um, so that's that's definitely one thing I can think of um, in terms of water consumption. Um, and yeah, the pipelines really just, um, you know, they had roads, the, the company owned roads that, that um, went along the pipeline so they could do um, repairs and things and its own telegraph and telephone system. So I do really see it as kind of, this sort of it's not so much that the company was like a state within a state right it was this it was this transnational entity that operated across states um and and really right across the region through these pipelines uh thanks Natasha it was super insightful I just had a quick question about the red light agreement that you mentioned at the very beginning I was wondering if there was any duration or maybe deadline um, attached to that agreement and if so when that was? Yeah, that, that's also a great question. Um, there wasn't a deadline when they signed it, um, but what ended up happening was that in 19, um, I'm going to get this, okay, don't quote me on these dates, but sort of um, around the time of the Second World War, um, the um, a couple of the American companies wanted to uh, basically, they, they wanted to get a concession for oil in Saudi Arabia. Um, so maybe it's 1930s, actually. Um, but but basically, in order to do that, they had to break the agreement um, because they, they wanted to do it without the other, without the IPC, the other um, shareholders in the IPC. And so the, there was a lot of commercial sort of pushback, especially from the French for this, um, and from Golbenkian as well, who, who said, like, no, I, well, if you're going to go and develop oil in, in Saudi Arabia, it's within the red line. We, you know, I want, I want a cut of this profit, right? So um, eventually the deal, they end up sort of coming to an agreement that they will break the red line agreement, allow development to go ahead in Saudi Arabia um, in exchange. And the French basically say, okay, well, then we want more pr- oil production from Iraq. And that's how the the pipeline gets built to Banias in Syria. So I would say it lasts till, till 1948. Um, and, in, and they actually sign a, a new set of agreements um, to govern then to sort of, it, it's a kind of moment of reshifting of this balance that they've created where they're managing the introduction of Middle East oil um, into the global oil economy. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, so. Okay. So. Uh, We have Rose up next. Hi, yes. Um, Thank you, Natasha and Mikey, for the great discussion. Um, I have a question um, just regarding overall kind of development of, um, I guess, political relationships in the region. Uh, I think it's really interesting that you've looked at um, kind of oil in the history of the region through the lens of all these multiple companies and how they've formed and also just a pipeline that spans across borders. Um, obviously presence and kind of development of oil in the region has been, um, has played a key role in how the politics uh, in the region have 
has developed over the years. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on, one, how that's kind of changed uh, through the years and through the movement of these uh, companies and development of the infrastructure, etc. cetera, um, and also how you think it may change going forward as these companies start to rebrand away from oil. Um, so, yeah, just interested in your thoughts. Thanks. Thanks. Um, okay, that, yeah, that's a really good question, a really hard one to answer, I think, succinctly. Um, there, there's definitely been a change over time, and, and it's hard to get into um, briefly sort of just all of all of the politics, because right, we're looking at this, get the oil companies and the pipeline, but there's this whole history of, of um, sort of the rise and fall of different um, political systems and governments um, within the different countries, um, different alliances. In the 50s, you've got sort of this Arab Cold War with Egypt and, and Saudi Arabia and different alliances, um, revolutions. Um, so there's so much going on there. Um, one thing I would say is about sort of the, the, in, in terms of change over time is that there's really a break um, from with, in sort of the early 1970s when Iraq in 1972 nationalizes the IPC. Um, and so this history that I'm talking about is really uh, up until that point. Um, and after the oil companies are nationalized, I think there's a whole different set of relationships and the global oil industry also changes um, quite dramatically um, in terms of how it organizes itself. And I don't know enough about that to then talk about sort of, yeah, how these, how these companies um, and then kind of thinking through climate change and how they might rebrand themselves or reposition themselves. But those are really interesting questions. Thanks so much. Um, thanks, Rose. So we have Mia up next. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Natasha and Mikey, uh, for the presentation. Uh, just curious, uh, actually, it's, maybe it's already answered before. Uh, what is the role of the Saudi Arabia uh, in the in the agreement and also um, in the right now COVID nineteen era, era? What is impacted in their relationship? Thank you. And yeah, these are also really great questions. Um, the first one is much easier than the second one for me to answer um, because, as I said, Saudi Arabia was. Um, within that red line agreement, but um, what ended up happening was that um, the IPC actually bid for a concession, um, but um, uh, Saudi Arabia basically didn't accept the price that the IPC were offering. Um, so they lost out on that. And then when the American companies um, went to go and get a concession, they had to then get out of the get out of the red line agreement. So the IPC didn't, was not involved. So it was only American companies that formed um, what's now, um, what, what's called Aramco, the, um, is it Arab American yeah. oil company? Anyway, so yeah. Um, so that's, so Saudi has a, has a different history outside of um, Iraq's oil development. Um, and yeah, in terms of COVID and the oil industry, it's such a fascinating question. And I feel like yeah, you need to bring in a different expert <laughs> for that. Unfortunately, history only gets me so, so far. Current day stuff, I'm like, no idea what's going on. You, you have some amazing pictures here. So congrats on finding them. Uh, <laughs> so I, I want to know, do you actually use these pictures, other pictures, as sources from which you draw findings for your work or you anticipate them being complementary, something that hopefully your eventual uh, book publisher will be willing to print, mm -hmm. et cetera. And if they're sources for you, what have you drawn from them? Right. That's a really, yeah, it's a really good question from, yeah, a, a fellow historian. <laughs> so um, in terms of the source material, um, yeah, these are the, when I, yeah, um, found these in the hotel archive, I was like super excited about them. Um, I am still trying to figure out how to use them. I, um, but I do anticipate one of the things I've really found hard is, um, in writing this history of the pipeline, ordinary people, workers, laborers, the people who you see in these pictures, they don't, they don't appear very much in sort of like documents that the old companies produced. So I do think that the, the pictures helped me get a, a sense of sort of like what it was like actually building the pipeline. So I'm hoping to use them in some way 
um, as actual sources to kind of tease out sort of, um, yeah, a, a sort of narrative of what was going on. I mean, the, the one on the bottom left, I just love, there was a whole series of these pictures of drivers with their trucks, essentially, a whole series. And this one was my favorite, just because this guy has the best pose, um, just kind of hanging on the door with his leg up. Um, but yeah, one of the things was that they used these these different um, machines and trucks. And, and I know that they hired local um, employees and they trained them into how to drive them. And there's also pictures of trucks that had skidded off the road and fallen over and were on fire. And so there were accidents. And so yeah, I think the pictures help definitely get at some of that stuff. So I don't think that they'll be just complimentary. I think I'll try and incorporate some of the things I found. Yeah, but that, that was my favorite one. I would love to know more about this guy just on his life. He was one of the ones I was thinking of saying I would shadow for a day. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's a little obscure and really nerdy, but it was too much. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much. Uh, we have Ibrahim. Uh, thank you, Natasha, and thank you, Mikey. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask if you have uh, uh, touched on your work on the economics per country of the revenue generated by IPC to mm -hmm. the country. I know for a fact that the top line was a major uh, revenue generator to the Lebanese government, uh, mm -hmm. although they had a very uh, much long, a much shorter uh, numbers of miles uh, or kilometers in the country where the IPC had a longer uh, uh, penetration. Uh, I know for a fact that Syria was earning a lot of money from the top line, although they had a very, very short uh, uh, land uh, rental. Uh, I don't know how much uh, was a, and you can see in your map that the crossing the Syria uh, IPC had a major crossing. Uh, so did you touch on the economics of that, the, how much uh, they had concessions and rental of these uh, properties? Yeah, that's, that's a fantastic question. Um, so actually, yeah, I actually have two chapters about this. I don't know if it's the economics, because I'm not trained as an economist, but what I did look at um, is that when, when the pipelines were built, which was in the 1930s, um, the Syria and Lebanon both signed concession re-agreements um, or, or transit conventions is what they were known as um, to sort of give the IPC rights to build these pipelines across their sovereign territories and um, sort of, a, a, you know, in the, in the vein of the sort of colonial period in which that was signed um, and largely during, or owing to the French, um, the IPC was given rights completely tax-free. They didn't give any revenues to Syria or Lebanon um, for operating these pipelines. And so in the 1940s and 50s, um, once Syria and Lebanon become independent nation states, um, there's, there's a huge battle with the IPC to get them to pay uh, revenues for the use of the pipelines. Um, and yeah, so I have two chapters that actually go into that, sort of how the IPC then tried to resist these demands um, and sort of how the revenues were calculated. What I haven't done is look so much at what the revenues um, then are used for within Syria and Lebanon's economy. And that would be really, really fascinating to be able to draw that line through the history. But um, but yeah, I can definitely, maybe not now, but talk, talk another time about, about sort of how um, Syria and Lebanon got revenues and what those revenues were and, and things like that. Okay, fantastic. We're going to take one final question from Rami, who's been patiently waiting. And then um, I also put into the chat the, a link to please fill out before you take off. But Rami, the floor is yours. Hello. Uh, thank you for this very interesting talk. Uh, I'm curious to know a bit more about um, how the outbreak of uh, the Second World War might have affected the uh, red line agreement and um, especially after France uh, fell to the Germans and uh, the Vichy government was installed. Mm -hmm. I know there was a lot of rivalry between the French and the British in the, re in the region and also that the Italians tried to uh, attack the refineries in Haifa. So I'm just curious about this period in the history of the pipeline. Yeah, that's, that's a really great question. Um, 
exactly what you say that the um shipping in the mediterranean during the war was um disrupted there was lots of attacks on on tankers and things like this um and so uh, and on haifa as you say um, was was definitely raided um red bombs and things like that so yeah the oil production definitely um decreased massively during the second world war and um yeah a, it causes a huge problem for france once um the vichy government takes over they take over the pipeline and they build a sort of makeshift refinery that's actually the origins of the, the refinery that to this day is still in tripoli is no longer um uh being used um and and after the second world war this whole the collapse of the red line agreement is also complicated because um by the fact that um the British government has um, declared Gulbenkian and the French shares in the IPC as an enemy property. And so they were unable to take, to participate in the IPC during the war. And so after the war, they're fighting back to get their rights back in the company. Um, they haven't been able to uplift their share of oil, these kind of issues. So yeah, the, the war definitely disrupts everything. Um, it's a great question. Natasha, thank you so much for joining. This was fantastic. Uh, I love talking to you about this stuff, and um, I hope you had fun with this one. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. This, uh, great questions were fantastic. I'm like, yeah, so many fantastic questions. So um, thanks for giving me a chance to talk about pipelines. <laughs> yeah, so everyone on the chat, thanks so much. You guys can uh, take off, um, and please join us for another talk uh, soon. Stay well, everybody. Yeah.